अवतार मेहर बाबा की जय वेलकम एवरीवन टू फ्रेगरेंस ऑफ लव मेहरा एंड वेमेन मंडली फ्राइडेज वे वी रीड सम पार्ट्स फ्रॉम द बुक मेहरा एंड समटाइम्स वी शैल हैव सम वीडियोस टू प्ले सम पिक्चर्स एंड देर आफ्टर हैव एनी पॉट लक स्टोरीज फ्रॉम एनी वन हु इज़ प्रेजेंट इन द सेशन हु has been with the women mandli eastern or western women mandli and if there are any stories and anecdotes to share then we will open the house for anyone to share anything any story any quote that you want we will begin with our meherdun Hey, 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 hey,
So we are reading today chapter 2 from the book Mehra, titled Childhood. Subtitle, Forests, Jungles and Government Bungalows, 1907 to 1915. In 1907, when Baba was 13 years old and attending St. Vincent's High School in Pune, Mehra was born in Sukkar, now in Pakistan the younger daughter of Jahangir and Dalat Mai Irani, both of whom were from Zoroastrian families settled in Pune. In January 1914, when Mehra was six years old, Baba Jan kissed Baba on the forehead and he experienced infinite bliss. My stories are not about spiritual matters. Baba told me that he has given everything in his books. What I can tell you about is our life with Baba, what happened when we were with him. It is a very long story. I was born in Sukkar, a city now in Pakistan, when, then in northwestern British India. Both my parents' families were from Pune and my father had a high post as a senior forest officer in the Indian Forestry Service. We lived in Sukkar for four years, after which we were transferred to other places, my father's last posting being to Junagadh in Gujarat. By we, I mean my father, my mother, and my sister Piroja, whom Baba later renamed Freni, who was five years older than I. My parents had had a son too, but he had died at a very young age before I was born. In Sukkar, we had all the conveniences of a very comfortable government bungalow with many servants, a cook, bearers, grooms, and a sweeper, and also a washerman, all staying in our compound. I remember too that we had our own carriage, a two-horse Victoria. As we go along, I'll just show some pictures. This is a picture of Mehra's parents just after their wedding. Dalat Mai and Jangir Irani. Those were such happy days. My sister and I were very much loved by our parents and especially by my father who enjoyed playing with us and spoiling us and seeing us happy. He was a fine-looking man, very tall and a broad chest and a good posture. And his nature was very fine too. So big-hearted and loving was he and full of energy and playfulness. I cannot remember be him being tired. He was fond of jokes and games and he also loved music. While he was gentle and soft-hearted, he was also very brave. My father truly did not know the meaning of fear because he loved people and he had, sorry, because he loved people, we had many friends and relatives visiting us from Pune and from other places too. My father used to take our guests sightseeing around Sukkar. Sometimes, we visited a Hindu temple on an island in the river. We would cross the river in a small boat and I remember that there were monkeys and peacocks roaming around the island. When we came to the temple, we took off our shoes and walked barefoot in a carpeted room full of pictures of holy men. Outside the temple, there were marble steps leading down into the river where we would watch fish being fed. One fish had a gold nose ring 
and that sight fascinated us children. Then I remember going to a mosque where the mullahs would light incense sticks and offer prayers and then bring out this silken box. What do you think was inside this box? Another box. And inside that, another box. And finally, in the innermost box was a hair of the Prophet Muhammad. As you can see in Baba's room at Mehrazad, we have his beautiful hair preserved in plexiglass. But in those days, there was no such thing. And this was their way of keeping it airtight. Sometimes too, our guests were taken to sample toddy, a light refreshing drink made fresh from the toddy palm, or taken for a picnic. Or we would go to a lovely lake in a park very close to our house. Our bungalow was on a hill and the park was at the foot of this hill. Part of my father's work was to inspect the forest in his area and when he went on tour, we often went too. Sometimes even when we were transferred, we traveled by camel. There were no motor cars or tongas in Sukkar. It was all forest and sand with very little rain. Instead of rainstorms, we had sandstorms. That caravan, sorry, that caravan was such a sight. Our tents and luggage went ahead by camel and my father's staff went on horseback. My mother traveled on the back of a very quiet she-camel sitting in a saddle made from an easy chair with a sunshade over her head. She took her books and knitting with her to pass the time as she rode along. My father had a big male camel, a very powerful, willful animal who could usually only be controlled by two able-bodied Sindhis. But my father was so strong that he would seat me behind him on the camel, tell me to hold on tightly, take the reins and off we would gallop. And I did not fall off. Camels run very smoothly. This camel was almost white and I remember that he had some colored beads and a beautiful woven collar with tassels around his neck. I also remember standing in front of him when he opened his mouth. His tongue was huge and so were his teeth and I was both frightened and fascinated. Our servants pitched our tents ahead of us. Such lovely tents they were, all decorated with scallops and tassels, with windows and furniture and carpets and a separate drawing room and bedrooms too. The kitchen tent was separate. My father was a good shot and often he would shoot a deer for our cooks to prepare and we always shared it with all those with us. We took a gramophone along too and at night we listened to music. I still recall a number of incidents where, when we were camping in forests and jungles, that made a strong impression on me as a child. I cannot remember the name of the nearest town, but I especially remember one night when we were camped in a jungle. Every night a blue enamel jug of milk was kept near my father's bed in the tent. Before going to sleep, he drank most of it and then put the jug back on his bedside table. This night we went, this night we all went to sleep, but in the middle of the night, suddenly in the dark, something hit me on the head and then bumped my mother. My mother started to scream and so did I. What a commotion. Everyone was running around in the dark and we could not see what it is. We finally managed to light the lantern and we saw a big wild cat running around inside the tent when the enamel jug stuck on his head. 
he must have been attracted into the tent by the smell of milk. He had put his whole head into the jug, lapped up the milk, then found he could not get it out. The poor cat was frantically rushing around with this jug on his head and no one could hold on to him. My father rolled up the canvas door and eventually the cat felt the fresh air and ran out with the jug still on his head. The next day, my father, feeling worried about the trapped cat, sent our servants out to look for him. Under a tree near a big stone, they found the battered jug. The cat had managed to bang the jug on the stone until it was free. So we were happy that the cat was safe. My mother was not fearless like my father. And at night, in a dark, thick forest, she would feel frightened. My father had a water spaniel and when tigers caught his scent, they would circle around and around our tent, roaring. Naturally, my mother was terrified, but my father would tell her, just go to sleep. It's all right. Nothing will happen. My mother would reply, but they are so near the tent. They might rip it open and come in. So my father would comfort her. He was never afraid of anything. At another village in a forest, my father heard of a thief who was stealing from the poor villagers. This thief was a tribal person who lived in the forest and who came out in the middle of the night to steal. One night, my father and one or two others waited in the little village and somehow in the middle of the night, my father caught the thief. He was tied to a post on the veranda of the forest officer's tiny office until morning and in the daylight, everyone saw how strong the thief was, how brave my father had been to tackle him, especially when the thief could have been carrying a knife. Our tent was not very far from the forest officer's little office where this man was tied. So I walked across to see my father. What fascinated me was not the thief, but a huge black scorpion that someone had hung on on the same veranda by a piece of string tied around its tail. Its pincers were enormous and so was the stinger in its tail. In its pincers, it held a fairly thick stick which the scorpion turned back and forth. It was so strong, it could hold the stick without dropping it. Often, when we were on tour, we would go together for an evening stroll in the surrounding forest. One night, we were just returning to our tents when we heard a rustling in the dry leaves on the ground. My father knew at once that this was a big snake, and he told my mother to take us children and the dog back to the tent. My mother tried to stop him, but he did not listen to her. He did not even have a stick, but somehow he managed to kill the snake with a rock. Then he picked it up with part of a branch from a tree and brought it back to our tent, where we were waiting with hurricane lanterns for him. My mother was horrified. Why have you brought that thing back here? Throw it away, she told him. But my father wanted to show us the snake's poison sacks. So despite her protests, he opened its jaws and pointed, up and pointed them out to us. I was very young, but I remember that snake's fangs and poison sacks very clearly. And my mother looked into the snake's mouth too even though she did not want to. Like this, she gave my father loving companionship. I also remember that when he was on tour, my father wore leggings to protect his legs. Leggings are like long leather socks, which cover your legs from the shoe tops to your knees. They wrap around the legs and are fastened on by buckles. 
When my father came back to our tent feeling very hot after being in the forest, he would sit in a folding chair while I sat at his feet and unbuckled his leggings. I loved doing this and I was very proud of myself. Finally, my father was transferred to the Junagadh district in Gujarat. And while we were staying there, my sister and I were sent to boarding school in Pune. I was six years old. My father had wanted us to be educated at home with tutors, but my mother was afraid that with their love for us, they would spoil us. So we were sent as weekly boarders to the convent of Jesus and Mary in Pune. On our school holidays, we came home. We had a nice two-story government house at Veraval. It was in a beautiful spot overlooking the ocean with just a little open ground between it and the beach. My sister began piano lessons at school, which made my father very happy. I was very young and I began lessons later. Because my father was always on the move, we did not have a piano but my parents had some European friends who had won and on holidays we visited these friends. On the piano, my sister would play the tunes she had learned and I remember that my father's favorite one was Home Sweet Home. Our neighbors in Veraval were a Christian family and amongst other children, they had a daughter just one year older than I. I remember that in the evenings, the servants would bring some chairs outside and these neighbors then joined us there for games and conversation. They had a son too who was of college age. His name was David, but I could not pronounce this and instead I called him Devil. We children loved to frolic on the beach and Devil used to put me on his shoulders then carry me out into the sea. What fun it was! My father was very sportive and he wanted to teach my mother how to swim. She, however, was not very keen to learn and they would squabble lovingly about it. Then to please him, she would go in just to her waist. In the mornings, we children used to walk along the beach. In one direction, the beach gradually became rocky and there would and there we had to gingerly pick our way. One morning on our walk, we saw something moving amongst the rocks. We did not know what it was, but somehow we managed to catch it. Very excitedly, we carried it home and showed it to my mother. It's a crab, she told us. But what am I going to do with it? Take it down to the cook. The cook was very, very happy with our present. But why bring one? He said to us, bring me more. More? We asked. How can we catch more? So he showed us how to make a little lasso with string and how to catch the crab's pincers with the loop. Then pull it tight. Back to the beach we went. My sister and I managed to catch another six or eight crabs which we brought home in a pail with a little sand in it. We handed them over to the cook and he made us a delicious crab curry. My father, when I was six, gave us our own ponies and taught us to ride. And I remember when I was tiny, being put on an elephant too. So as a child, I rode elephants, camels and horses. I loved to ride my pony along the beach in front of our house. We always had servants with us to look after the horses. And one day I galloped away down the beach. I can still hear one of the servants shouting after me, Stop! Mary! Baba! Stop! He was a Muslim and they called children Baba. While we were at Junagadh, my father also took us up a mountain not too far away from where Baba later sat in seclusion. It is called Girnar Mountain and living there in caves are holy men with long hair and nails. 
We left very early in the morning and my mother and some of our guests were carried up in sailing chairs. It was a steep climb and we all, except my father, stopped at a rest house and temple on the way up. He climbed up much further and visited an even higher temple. He was always full of energy and never tired. Just a few final memories from my early childhood, I remember how my father saved his bearer's wife. They were a Muslim couple and very faithful to my father. She was a nice young woman and one day when she was outside walking in some grass, a poisonous snake suddenly bit her. My father knew that he had to act very fast and he also knew what he had to do. Quickly, he made some cuts across the snake's bite, tied a tourniquet of handkerchiefs around her leg to stop the poison circulating in the blood and put some potassium permanganate on the wound. She was very fortunate that my father was there because she did live. And I remember too how my father saved some villagers. Around Junagadh, the forests are very deep. And once some people from a nearby village, jungle village, sorry, a nearby jungle village came running to my father saying, Oh, please, sir, there are some tigers who are stealing our calves and goats and sheep. This is a great loss to us. Please kill the tigers. So my father had a hide built in a tree and he waited there for the tigers to come. He was a sure shot and managed to shoot these man-eating tigers and save the villagers and their animals from attack. So brave was he that once he even went into the forest alone after a wounded tiger found it in its lair and shot it so that it would not suffer. He shot these tigers not for the sport or for love of shooting, but to help the poor. These are some of my early childhood memories. My early years were very, very happy ones. We had an interesting, carefree life, full of love and adventures. Chair Baba. So this was Mehra's childhood in her early years. This is a picture of young Mehra. Sweet young Mehra out here. And this is with her parents and sister, Piroja, who was later named by Baba as Freni. Would anyone like to share anything about Mera before we read some more? Any little anecdote that you've read, any quote, any story, anything about any other women, Mandli? You can please raise your hand or unmute and share if you would wish to. Yes, Paula, please unmute. Hi, sorry, it's early in the morning here, so Mara would not like that I'm in my pajamas. <laughs> um, I, you probably know this, but Jahangir was, um, you know, Jahangir was Mara's father's name and it means conqueror of the world, which he was. <laughs> Amazing, amazing, brave person her father was. Anyway, that's just Have what you I've met Mera Paula? Yes. Yes. 
would love to hear something from you. Um, well, I, I've told my stories before, but um, she, um, she, she was she was so much like Baba in that she knew exactly what to do with each person. She knew exactly the perfect response or not response. She was natural for, for me, it was very natural to be with her, but also <clears throat> um, you could feel that, well, I felt the, how can I put it? The difference between her and me because she was a pure soul in the universe and I could feel that. Um, and what, well, okay, I guess I'll tell this part. It's like, um, it was entombment day. I'll make it a short version, but it was on entombment day. And, <clears throat> and the, there was a, there was a huge wind around um, Maribad Hill. My son was 11 and he was with me and he was scared. He didn't go up the hill. But it was uh, RT and the women came for entombment day. And it was very crowded. It was in 1986. And someone, um, I was going to leave in two days. And so someone said, oh, you're leaving soon. You have to be in the tomb <clears throat> with the women. So I kind of, I don't, you know, you know, don't know how Baba does these things, but he just does it. He puts you where he wants you. And, and <clears throat> I never knew what he was doing and, and how he was doing it. But anyway, he put me where he wanted me and where I wanted to be. But I was in the Samadhi and <clears throat> we um, <clears throat> were, like I said, it's early morning. <laughs> Not early morning, but for me it is. No worries. Do you want to grab some water? Yeah. No, it's okay. So it. It came, it, it was a time when um, we could put our heads on Baba's feet, each one at a time. And there was a basket of flowers and I put one on Baba's feet and I put flowers on Baba's feet for everybody I could think of. But this time I thought, Baba, this one's for me. But what was so special was Mara was right next to me. She was sitting on the ledge right next to me. And that just meant everything to me. And then what happened was um, when Mara put her head on Baba's feet, uh, thunder rolled. And I knew that, it, I mean, the thunder is the voice of God. And I heard it, it was like, it was amazing. And everything inside of me, I, it, I just caught my breath. Everything inside of me knew. And I thought, I remember thinking clearly I'm in the presence of love bowing down to love itself. And I have no idea what that is, but I know that I'm in the presence of everything real, everything that's real. So that's kind of an abbreviated version of it. But anyway, that's, that was Mara, being in the presence of everything that, everything that, that exists that's real was Mara. And somehow she made it easy too at different times, just really natural. The way she would pay attention to little things, you know, it's like the way she. <laughs> I was having a picture taken. I was the only one on the veranda left, and and there was one person, and I said, "Would you take a picture of me with Meru?" Because Meru and I, I mean, yeah, I was really attached to Meru too. And Mara came out, and I said, "Oh, Mara, do you want to be in the picture too?" <laughs> And she was like, yeah. So she came up and she just was playing with my scarf. And she was, she was just saying, how beautiful, how beautiful. And the way it worked out, um, she, oh, and I had a locket uh, that I was wearing. And Mara said, oh, is Baba's picture in the locket? And I said, yes, Mara. And she said, oh, let me see, let me see. So I opened it and she kissed it. So I have that locket and I have for kiss for Baba. And then when I was leaving, Meru even just, just went, you know, Meru was never by herself, but she was, she was by herself on the veranda and I was leaving. I was going the next morning 
And so she just waved me as I, as I left, you know, so that was my, um, the last time that I, that I was able to see her, but being with her was a treasure. It didn't matter how long or how short it was, you know, Baba gave you, he, he just gave you everything, you know? So there's not words that can really describe it, being with Mara. You know, we talked about farmers. We talked about, you know, things. I just, I just like that. And the stories about her, uh, Vesta Clinton has some wonderful, wonderful stories because she was with Mara in her early 20s and she was with her a lot and you know slept on the floor and and was aware of merit during the night and um her stories are just i hope she has a book someday or something because the, her stories just take put you there you know which is what vesta said too she said you know when we hear stories about baba and mara just put yourself in the story because you're there that's where we all belong so anyway that was that's a kind of a um, fractured version of <laughs> at this time. It's not really early morning, but <laughs> yeah, it's okay. enough. Oh, and I wanted to say it's, I, I have the book, but it's lovely to hear you read it. It's just so, it's wonderful. It's just wonderful to hear you read it out loud. So anyway, so thank you, Roshini. Jay Baba. Jay Baba, thank you so much, Paula, for a wonderful share. So precious. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, okay, we will read some more and then again have some stories or discussion. Continuation of Chapter 2, Pune, 1915 to 1921. In 1915, Mehra with her mother and sister came to live in Pune, and during that year, Mehra, and during that year, Meher Baba, then known as Mehrwan, went, met the remaining four perfect masters of the time, Narayan Maharaj, Tajuddin Baba, Sai Baba, and Upasni Maharaj. Upasni Maharaj, on seeing Baba, flung a stone at him hitting Baba on the forehead where Baba Jan had kissed him in 1914 and thus began Baba's return to normal consciousness. During the following years, Baba stayed mostly in Pune. He managed a theatrical company for two months, worked in his father's, toddy, worked in his father's tea and toddy shop all the time, constantly visiting Baba Jan and sometimes Upasni Maharaj. In 1918, Baba opened a toddy shop in Kaspapet in Pune city and the same year Sai Baba dropped his body. In 1919, Baba's family moved from Pumpkin House to nearby Baba House in Pune where Baba knocked his forehead on a stone in his small room there. This knocking of his forehead had first begun after Upasni Maharaj had flung the stone at Baba in 1915. At the toddy shop, Mehrwanji now began to attract a group of spiritual seekers, some of whom later became his mandli. Throughout 1920 and 1921, Baba's frequent visits to Upasni Maharaj continued, culminating in a six-month continuous stay at Sakori from July to December 1921. By the end of this stay, Baba had been unveiled as the avatar of the age. It was in Junagadh when he was 40 years old that my father had a fall from a horse and that was to change our lives. In this fall, he hurt his ear and he went to Bombay to the Masina Hospital to consult a doctor about it. Surgery was recommended, but before having it, my father decided to visit his parents in Pune. His mother suggested that he also consult their family doctor there in Pune and to please her, he did. This doctor told my father that the operation was so minor that he could easily do it then and there. My father believed him 
and he had the operation in this doctor's house in a small, ill-equipped and dusty surgery. His parents did not inform my mother, who was in Junagadh, about the operation. The incision became septic and my dear father suddenly passed away. My poor mother was absolutely heartbroken and so were we. The last time we had seen my father, he had been strong and healthy. And now, suddenly, because of a careless operation, he was gone. The shock was terrible for my mother and after this we rarely saw my father's family. Many years later I heard that Baba's father Sheryarji had helped to carry my father's body to the Tower of Silence and that when he returned home that day, Sheryarji had said that he had never seen anyone with such a fine, strong, healthy body as my father. My mother now had to return to her family house in Pune. I was eight years old when, at the invitation of my maternal uncle Ardeshir, we moved into his house, a very big bungalow in the vicinity of Bund Garden, where my grandparents and two maternal uncles, their wives and children lived. Ardeshir was the eldest uncle and head of the household and he always was very kind and generous to us. He owned a successful soft drink factory in the Sachapir Street area of Pune. Another of my mother's brothers, Colonel M. S. Irani, was a surgeon serving in a hospital in Aden in the Middle East, as the First World War had then started. He was very fond of my mother, so when my father passed away, he took leave and came quickly to Pune to comfort and console her. When he arrived, my mother clung to him and sobbed her heart out. My mother was so shocked and heartbroken by my father's passing that she took to constant prayers morning, noon and night. She would walk alone with our spaniel down to the river, which was not far from our house. And there, near a well, she would light an oil lamp and offer flowers and pray. When she later heard of Babajan from her sister Freni Masi, she would be seated by Babajan's side every evening. Now that we were settled in Pune, we became day girls at the same school, the convent of Jesus and Mary, where we had been boarders, and I loved to hear the nuns tell stories about Jesus and his disciples. When I was nine years old, on the first anniversary of my father's death, my Navjot, initiating me into the Zoroastrian faith, was performed. One day, when I was 10 or 11 years old, one of my school friends named Zina came running to me at recess time when we children were playing after lunch and said, Mera, let's go to Baba Jan. She is very great. Whatever we ask for, she will give us. You ask for something and I'll ask for something. Come on, do let's go and see her. Yes, but what about the school bell? I asked. I thought Baba Jan was always seated under a neem tree some distance from our school and we might be late for class. Today Baba Jan is sitting right outside. So is so she is so near, sorry, she is so near that we won't be late for class, Zina replied. So together hand in hand, we ran out of the school grounds and towards Babajan, who was seated behind the convent wall. But as we came near to her, I began to feel very shy. I said to my friend, How can I go up to Babajan? I've never thought of asking for anything. I don't have anything to ask for. You go first. But Zina replied, Never mind, think hard. And when we reached Baba Jan, Zina knelt before her and made her request. Then it was my turn, and I still could not think of anything to ask for. But I went very shyly up to Baba Jan and knelt before her. She looked at me sweetly and said, what is it, my child? Still, 
I did not know what to ask for because I had everything. I started thinking very hard and as I looked across the road, I saw a horse and carriage pass by. The thought came to me that I would like a horse to ride because since my father's death, my mother had kept only a carriage horse. A horse needs to be looked after and she did not want the bother and she did not want the bother of more servants and more work. So I told Baba Jan, Baba Jan, I would like a horse. Now, that sounds a bit childish, but at that time, it did not seem childish to me. I loved horses and Baba Jan looked at me, gave a slight, very sweet smile and nodded her head. Then she looked up towards the sky. Yes, he will be very beautiful. You will get a horse and all the world will see him and love him. She spoke very softly and in Urdu and I could not hear her very well, but those words I caught. Then she patted me and told me, now you can go my child. And I was glad to leave as I was feeling very, very shy. But I also felt happy because I thought that I would have a beautiful horse that many would admire when I rode it. Just then the school bell rang. So my friend and I caught hands and ran back to the school. I completely forgot that I had asked Baba Jan for a horse. Then one evening, some months after this meeting, after I had come home from school and was playing Gilli Danda in our compound with my cousins, my aunt said to me, Mehra, go and see what a beautiful horse your mother has bought. I thought she was teasing me, but she repeated it. Go to the stables and see. I ran to the stables and I was overjoyed to see there this very, very, beautiful horse. I could not believe my eyes. He was so beautiful. He was snow white with not a speck of color anywhere. His nose and his skin were pink, not black. One of his eyes was blue and the other one was black. And he was very well fed and well kept. In the stable, he started to prance and shake his head and neigh. And I knew he was a spirited horse. I was even happier as I'm not fond of very quiet riding horses. My mother later told me that she had been returning home in a tonga and out from an outing and had seen a crowd of people. She stopped and in the middle of this crowd there was this beautiful white horse which she liked so much that she immediately bought him and had him brought home. Just two days after the horse arrived, I began to think, why am I not riding this horse? I loved to ride, but since my father's death, I had not had the chance. I knew that I would not be allowed to ride this white horse as he was new and very spirited and my elders would be afraid that I would have a fall. But my father had taught me well, and I was not at all afraid. All our saddles and bridles had been brought to Pune after my father's death and dumped in a big storeroom at my grandparents' house. So I went quietly inside, found a saddle and a bridle, and had the groom saddle the white horse. He thought I had permission to ride, but I had not. He helped me mount and I quietly rode the horse out a back gateway so my elders would not see me. But my aunt did see me and though she called me back, I kept riding down to a lonely sandy brittle path near Bund Garden along with the British like to ride. There I tried out this horse's paces, trotting and cantering and after a while lovely and after a long, lovely ride, I came home safely. So my elders saw that I could manage the horse and they allowed me to ride him again. 
I used to give him treats of sugar, so he came to know me. A few years passed and my mother bought as an investment a very beautiful house on Todiwala Road in Pune, which had been rented to a European couple, a Mr. and Mrs. Mandy. A little later, perhaps it was in 1919, after we had been staying in my grandparents' house for four years, my eldest uncle Ardishir died. He had been very sympathetic towards my mother, but with his death, she no longer felt comfortable in her, fa in her family's house. So when our tenants returned to England, we moved into number 9 Todiwala Road. I was about 12 years old. It was a very lovely place. The house was large with separate servants' quarters and stables. The garden was twice the size of Merazar, with several hundred beautiful trees and a broad shaded drive up to the house from the road. On returning from school, we could feel the coolness of our garden as we turned into the drive. The house was at the end of Todiwala Road, a very good and quiet locality. Nearby were fields and it was very quiet and dark at night. We had a carriage horse, the white horse and our pet water spaniel. Our neighbours were some Europeans, the Raja of Kolapur and a wealthy family from Bombay, the Todiwalas, after whom the road had been named and who later come into my story. One day while we were living at Todiwala Road, I remember riding the white horse across a low-lying field near our house towards a raised road. As we came close to the road, he started to lunge and rear. I jumped off and landed quite safely in the field. And what happened next was this. The saddle immediately slipped off the horse. The girth had broken and had the horse not reared when he did, I would not have jumped off and could have had a very bad fall later. I managed to catch the reins, but the horse was too strong and excited for me to hold for long. Fortunately, at that moment, two servants from the nearby houses of the Raja of Kolapur and some Europeans came running up. So I remounted him and they very kindly led me home riding bareback. Now this white horse was very mischievous. He had a friend, a carriage horse, from next door, and my white horse would somehow get loose and visit him. Then both of them would prance and frolic around our compound and around other people's too. This would upset our neighbours, and that would upset my mother. However, because of my school work, piano lessons, piano practice, theory of music lessons and other things I had to do, I had very little time to ride. Since I only rode the white horse a few times, my mother decided that he should be useful and learn how to draw a carriage. So our groom would tie a plank behind the horse to get him used to pulling a weight. One day, he even let me stand on this plank and off we went across a field. It was such fun. Before reading further, I would like to show these pencil drawings by Mehra of literary heroines done when she was about 14 years old and living on Todiwala Road, Pune. Shown here are the actual size. The first one is Lady Rowena from Evanhoe. B is Miranda playing chess. C is Rebecca. And D is Catherine the Shrew. I hope you all can see the drawings. So Mehra was a very, very beautiful artist as well. And these portraits were drawn by her then. My mother later built a second smaller house on the foundation of a broken down house in our compound. 
We moved there when it was finished and rented out the main bungalow. My mother also bought three small cottages, White House, Cozy Cottage and Beehive in Mahableshwar, a hill station between Pune and Bombay. As a child, I knew Mahableshwar well and later spent much time there with Baba. My mother often took my sister and me to stay in Cozy Cottage. We now changed schools from the Convent of Jesus and Mary, which was far from our new house, to St. Helens. At school, I loved Shakespeare plays, especially The Tempest, stories of saints, the novels of writers like Dickens and Sir Walter Scott, and playing the piano. But I was never top of my class. I much preferred playing games with my friends to school work. Jai Meher Baba. This is the end of chapter 2. If anybody wishes to ask anything, read any part or line, anything that you feel. Or we have some more people here. Anybody wants to share any story, personal experience with Mehra or any story, anecdote with Baba about Mehra or the women monthly. Please raise your hands and let's hear some people share. Or any quote of Baba. Yes, Jeff, please. Okay. I'll read something that I have in my notebook on the front of my notebook. These are Baba's words. And Baba says to us, if you make me your real father, all differences and contentions between you and all personal problems in connection with your lives will be dissolved in the ocean of my love. The only real surrender is that in which poise is undisturbed by any adverse circumstance and the individual amidst any hardship is resigned with perfect calm to the will of God. Jay Baba. Thank you, Jeff. Jay Baba. Thank you. So we have Hawobi auntie also who is here. So Hawobi auntie, you had said next session I'm going to share some more stories. Yes, Rosalie. Jai Baba. Um, Jai Baba. In my times of being with Mara, I, I had seven, I came seven times in pilgrimage from the United States and uh, Mara was my favorite. You know, it was, she felt like beyond Mondali. You know, she just felt like you were just sitting there with Baba. Uh, Mara was incredibly supportive of women, is what I wanted to say. Um, she was, uh, I found personally, she was very supportive of me and, and my art. I like performing and um, I like making people laugh. And um, she actually told me one time on the porch with everyone there that I had been born. She asked me, first she says, she didn't ask me, she says, Rosalie, you enjoy entertaining, don't you? Just kind of out of the blue, as the expression goes. And I just, I have to say, it went right to my heart. And I said, yes, Mara, I love performing. And she says, you were born for that. And um, anyway, it was just a, an incident of that support. Uh, 
I do feel very strongly that this coming of Baba, this very powerful advent, uh, as as uh, one of the Mandali used to say, he said it was seven eleven. It was the seventh cycle of eleven cycles, and. It would make me happy when I heard him say that. His name was Joseph Arb, and he was born into a Sufi family in Lebanon. But at any rate, uh, I, I feel this Baba did such work with Mara, such, such a strict, um, her life was very uh, under Baba's total nazar, you know, I mean, he had her for a good while. She couldn't even hear a man's name or she couldn't read. He didn't allow, allow her to read, but now Mero is very bright, a very bright person. Um, and, um, Anyway, she she was so dedicated to doing everything that Baba said, including I know one time Baba told her to only eat half a banana. And then on after Baba passed, she would only eat half a banana. So I think of her when I'm eating bananas, I like to eat a half. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to say that. And I also wanted to say, that he said that Mara shared his suffering uh, when he had his first accident in the United States. And um, I feel that was also so much his work with women for the upliftment of women. So I, I just know it's gonna bring this incredible change as far as how women are seen in the world, how they're treated, and actually how men are treated differently as a result. But at any rate, I just wanted to share that and my feelings very strong of, of the strong work he did in Mara, with Mara. And uh, anyway, that's what I wanted to share, Jay Baba. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Rosalie. Gosh, all of these shares are so precious and so fortunate are we to hear it from all of you. And getting this opportunity to listen to all of you is uh, no words can actually express how precious it is. Yes, Paula. Thank you, Rosalie. Jay Baba. Yes, Jay Baba. Yeah, that or you can uh, unmute. Yeah. Oh, am I not? Yeah, I'm still. Am I uh, unmuted? I uh, yes, you're unmuted. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <clears throat> I know. I heard. Um, it blew my mind when, um, when Baba said. I heard that Baba said that Mara took half of the suffering <laughs> of that accident, and and that accident was so huge for us. I mean, it's, I, we can't even imagine what Baba was doing and what Mara did. I mean, what happened to, even physically, just what happened to her um, and that she should, you know, the doctor thought that she would not survive. So, but women did survive, didn't we? <laughs> Who knows? We, we don't know. Um, my friend Jill was at one of the, I think it might've been the very last tea that, that Mara had, that Mara was present for. And at the end of the tea, Mara always goes up to Baba's, you know, Baba's picture. But Mara said, she said, um, I, this is close to the exact quote, because um, I wasn't there, but um, Jill was. And she said, Mara said, well, Baba's a father. And I guess that makes me the mother. And I really, and I really felt that um, it felt like in me, in my heart, it felt like an announcement 
that she's my mother, that she's our mother, and that she and she's like beyond whatever that word ever has meant. She's so much more. I mean, we just we just don't even know, but um, we do have a mother in her, and we have it's like like Baba in his female aspects, you know, how how he pays attention to us as the mother, you know, as the father and the mother. And it's just, and there were stories that were going, that were, you know, that were happening around the time that Mira went to Baba. And it was how she was, she also was saying that she was Mary, that she was, there was a, um, I don't know, people have probably heard this story, but there was a woman. Yeah. She, yeah. Well, there was an American Indian woman who had a really difficult life and she was raised Catholic and she was abused and really had a hard time. And um, what she would do, it would get better whenever she prayed to Mary. Well, she became a Baba lover and Mara was taking her around the garden at Marazad and showing her her garden. And all of a sudden, Mara turned and looked at her, looked her in the eyes, and she said, When you prayed to Mary, it was I who heard you. So, those kinds of stories were happening, a lot of them, around the time that Mara went to Baba. It was like an announcement this is who I am, and this is who I am for you. Anyway, Jay Baba. Jay Baba, thank you so much. Thanks for that. Yes, we can't even imagine, uh, you know, and I think. Uh, for me, I feel that uh, just the way Baba has said that it takes those 100 years of manifestation for the entire world or universe to kind of know the avatar of the age. And so will her importance uh, come to light more and more as well as we come closer. And uh, yes, as Rosalie said about, uh, I feel all through uh, while uh, Baba was in his you know body and uh, through with mera the entire rise of the divine feminine of you know the way women are looked the way women are achieving the way women are you know moving forward i think has a strong role play in uh, you know mera being the counterpart for this precious and important advent and i I personally feel, uh, you know, her uh, being hand in glove quite a lot of times with Baba's doings and can see that, you know, it's not just uh, for any sakes that Baba would have said that she is the very breath he can't live without. Yes, Rosalie. That reminds me uh, of... You know, Baba said, Mary is my very breath. Without, I cannot live. Uh, and also there was a quote, and I, I can't give a source except a Baba lover named of Adele Walken that met him in 1952, very dedicated to Baba, used to quote that Baba had said this time he was both mother and father. So um, I... I when I was remembering that right now, and I thought she was so much Baba when I was around her, you know, it was like I was with Baba. If I made her laugh, I was making Baba laugh. Um, if it, you didn't want to just please her. I remember this uh, incident happened where Mara had rolled some of Baba's young hair. She put him in a little roll so they could be in a container that someone wanted Baba's hair in this little silver container. 
And I was so excited. I think it was the first, my first time in India. And I, I got very excited and I thought, oh, I want, I want that too. And so <laughs> I went to Mary and I said, oh, Mary, will you do that for me? And she, <laughs> she did not say yes. She went just, uh, it just seemed like she was displeased. And she says, do you think I have nothing else to do with my time? Blah, blah, blah. You know, and I was like, I, I was like, um, just shocked. And, uh, you know, she kind of went on and on about it. And then I would say I heard Baba's voice because it was at that point in time, I was so shocked. And it says, don't make Mara unhappy Be because my, I was about to burst up crying, you know, and, and I could see it, it was like I was looking out in the ocean, a porthole and the ocean was there like, you know, and then when those words came, I, it went down. And I, I didn't, you know, uh, but um, I, I do, my feeling is that that the counterpart, the chosen one is always, it's the avatar, it's the female part of the avatar. And I see it even more clear in this advent. They always, uh, and even the fact is, that, and they say Mara Meher, and they said Sita Ram, you know, it's like, uh, God is just that whole, he's just, you know, and it's, it can't be separated without my breath, you know. Anyway, I wanted to say that, but Mara of, of anyone that I've ever met, I had the strongest reaction because it was like meeting Baba. It was meeting Baba, you know, yeah. And I actually, when I first saw her, it was in the Samadhi. There were just a few of us and she was so inward. She was I didn't know how she was walking around because she was so, I, I just have to call it inward. She was so with Baba that, and she would only come to the Samadhi after Baba. She would come twice a month for RT. I don't remember anyone else coming with her. And you know, she never, she, she was never alone. So I know they were there, but you know, it was the first time I saw her. So I was so taken aback and, uh, and then the next day I met her on the porch and it was more, you know, it was like meeting someone in their home. Uh, but I felt Baba wanted me to know who she was, you know, her role that not separate before I met her more casually, casual, you know, but anyway, uh, uh, very, very important. Uh, yeah, to meet her. I, you, I, and which year I did? Her, you, yeah. Which year did you get to know of Baba Rosalie? Just wanted to ask. Um, I heard about Baba and, and uh, a roommate of mine 